What's up, guys? This is David Gordon. Welcome back to another episode of Contra Mundum. I am here today with my former colleague at Church Militant, uh, Jake Harden. How are you doing, Jake? No, no, all right, Dave. How about you? Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, guys, just a, a quick note here. I know there hasn't been much content from my channel for the last few weeks, um, but that's just because in the the wake of the shakeup uh, over at St. Michael's Media, you know, I've been having to do other things. It's been a scramble, um, but don't fear. There is going to be more content coming up, so please stay with us. Um, importantly, uh, thank you to everyone who supported this channel. Thank you to all of my Patreon subscribers. Um, your your support is most appreciated. I want to send out notes to y'all um, in the coming weeks. It's been a slog, but thank you for your support, especially at this time. It's meant a lot to me, a lot to my family, and um, I just want to give you my sincere gratitude uh, for for your ongoing support. That said, and um, also, you know, those who are not subscribed, please subscribe to the channel and please do kindly consider supporting this channel on Patreon. Um, that said, Jake, you recently wrote a piece in Where Peter Is, uh, really rebuking Cardinal Mueller, the former head of the CDF, for an essay he wrote in the pillar, essentially, essentially denouncing fiducia supplicants, this uh dicastery for the doctrine of the faith document uh that was promulgated under um the auspices of pope francis it was written by the um current head of that dicastery cardinal fernandez and of course it was causing a big stir because of the um the the imprimatur it gave to extending certain blessings certain informal non-liturgical blessings to homosexual couples and a lot of people essentially lost their head over that said look this is rome this is the the holy see um really dabbling in heteropraxy in errant uh practice um and of course steeped in heresy and a lot of people fiercely denounced um that document fiducia supplicans and i think wrongly so in your essay of course, in where Peter is, a, a fine piece, and I'm going to put that in the um, show notes. So please, guys, take a look at this uh, on where Peter is. You essentially are standing up for this document against even high-profile uh, critics like Cardinal Mueller, and you're saying, this is why you're wrong, guys. This is why this is not a departure from sound Catholic theology and sound Catholic practice. Um, I mean... That's that's basically I think we've set the table uh, anything to add right at the outset. You know, what really got you uh, to move uh, to sit down and be like, I really want to grind out this essay, this rebuke to Cardinal Mueller. Uh, and we're going to get into the fine details later in the show. But anything you want to say uh, right at the outset, Jake? Uh, yeah, Dave, thank you again for having me. You know, Canon 212 talks about how, you know, we can correct our sacred pastors who might be making a mistake, but we have to do it with uh, reverence. I, I read Cardinal Mueller's essay, and I really thought that this would be an opportunity to do that because, unfortunately, I think the cardinal, he either didn't understand the document or maybe he, I don't know. Um, so I felt like Canon 212 applied here, and I, I, should, I should do something about this because I saw friends like sharing this on social media and putting in group chats and things like that, and it was leading some of my friends down the the wrong track. So I was like, I, I went ahead and read it and I was like, okay, this has some holes in it. Um, okay. I'm, I'm going to, you know, look at the church documents and apply it to what he's talking about. And there's, I mean, there's some pretty shocking things that he puts in this article in the pillar. He, he talks about how essentially a priest has to not act in the name of the church or have rejected Christ to be able to perform these blessings. And I was like, okay, we got to hold up here. Like let's, let's slow the roll here. And, um, you know, look at, what church uh, teaching actually says, and then look at what fiducia supplicans actually says. Yeah, excellent points. And I think you're perceiving what a lot of people, um, what a growing number of people uh, in conservative Catholicism are perceiving is that there is a menace growing in the church on the right 
Now, we're so used to the menace being from the left, and there is a veritable menace on the left, and there are people that are heterodox and are scheming to undermine the teaching of Holy Mother Church on the left. And we're so used to fighting them that we're now saying, like, okay, anything that is coming from a place of conservative theology or quote unquote conservative theology, because I want to get into this in a second. There's nothing conservative about parting ways with the Pope. You know, whether you think you can wrap your mind around what he's saying or not, if you think you can part ways with the Pope, you, my friend, are a child of the Enlightenment, whether you like it or not. Um, a lot of people are are so used to seeing things, though, in this dichotomy of like left good or sorry, left bad, right good, that they are now being led down the wrong path by commentators on the right who are breaking from Rome and essentially saying they're more Catholic than the Pope. And of course, every heresy for the history of the church has been people who thought that they were more more Catholic than the Pope, more Catholic than Holy Mother Church. Every single time. Y'all aren't unique. Like if you break from Rome, there's no good outcome for it. But people are being deceived because for our lifetimes, there's been so much mischief on the left with regard to like birth control, homosexuality, um, divorce and remarriage, uh, you know, basically all of the church's sexual teachings. Um, they have been seeking to undermine the moral teachings of the church. So we're so groomed uh, to being against the left and any time um, – we see anything that appears to be a concession in the direction of like, okay, we are going to perform a certain outreach to the divorced and remarried or to homosexual couples, not homosexual unions, but homosexual couples. Um, and we are going to strive to incorporate them more into the church while retaining uh, Orthodox doctrine and uh, orthopraxy with our blessings. You know, that's seen as bad, a capitulation, which of course it's not. So, but a lot of people, nevertheless, you know, they see things kind of simplistically and they're like, well, I'm going to side with the people on the right because the right is right. Right. Um, and I think that's what's happening here. And, you know, this is something that's in Ratzinger report. if you read, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger's, uh, kind of famous interview, that's an Ignatius press publication now. Um, you know, he very much alludes to the fact that there is a lurking menace on the right in the church as well. Like, there is no right Catholic and left Catholic. There is just Orthodox Catholic. If you are not just a pure, unmodified son of the church, there's something wrong with you. And I think, I mean, do I have that right? That's, that's my take. That's like my little opening that I would want to give the audience. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're spot on, Dave. I think, you know, the left, uh, they have the tendency for the last eight years or whatever it's been to, you know, all of their problems are orange man bad. And I think <laughs> in the rat track community, it's like all of their problems are Bergoglio bad, Bergoglio bad. <laughs> like, I think I think unfortunately they've adopted the same mindset and um, like they see everything through the lens of, you know, I think you've talked about this on your channel before, is they see everything through the lens of the American right wing. Like the Republican Party does not have, you know, the same charism of infallibility or the same protections that, you know, the Pope does. Like we're, we can't we can't look at this through a political lens. And I I think that, you know, the I, I see a growing number of people on social media and maybe sometimes in person that, are you know, they identify themselves they identify themselves as like, I'm a traditional Catholic. It's like, let's get back to, you know, let's just be normal Catholics. Let's just be faithful Catholics. And then um, we'll, we'll sort out the rest, the rest later. And I, I think your point about, you know, you, you know, we see everything in the culture. We see all the degeneracy. We see, you know, drag queen story time and everything else. And we're like, okay, the left, the left wing is definitely the problem. It's the problem for the, uh, throughout the whole world. Like, how could we even be worried about, um, uh, the right wing in, in any, uh, in any society, but it's like, okay, but in the church, it really is the, it really is the far right. That's like doing most of the damage. If you look at like, just scroll through social media, the people that get the most interaction are the rad trad podcasters. It's like the people that are left wing, they get ratioed on like all the left wing Catholics. They get ratioed like every time they tweet. So just basing it off social media, you can, you can tell that, you know, the problem is from our, uh, the other side of the ship, the right way, the right side.
Yeah, that's an interesting point. That's something that's not said. Obviously, you know, I think people on the right, if you just had this broad scale, like this, you could have a scale and see like how close to the truth they are. I think the people on the right, even those in sinful dissent on the far right, are are a lot closer to the truth than people on the left. But the l- people on the left are essentially just shouting into the wind because it's so obvious that what they're saying is wrong. Like if you deny humane vitae and you say that Catholics can't have recourse to contraception or something like that, or you say that, you know, uh, divorce and remarriage is fine, um, you know, not talking about like getting an annulment and all of this, but just like, you know, the church should come around on that or the church should come around and, you know, kind of adopt a uh, situation ethics as opposed to like having objective morality with um, things that are inherently evil. Like no one cares what the left says because that stuff's far fetched and the church has spoken and foreclosed on all of that stuff that they're saying. So it just, yeah, it gets ratioed. They're just like, yeah, yeah, shut up. <laughs> You're not important. <laughs> the problem with the right, even though what the people who are errant on the right, and of course, you know, in terms of like the culture wars, Orthodox Catholicism is going to be, quote unquote, conservative, you know, by by the standards of America. So I'm not talking about just being an Orthodox Catholic, but I'm talking about the dissenting right, the rad trads. The problem with what they're saying is that it sounds plausible enough. It's steeped close enough to the truth that it's actually peeling off a large segment of you know, the Catholic um, social media population and bringing them over into dissent as well, into sin as well, and ultimately to apostasy. You know, a lot of people have apostatized and you'll see it. I saw it on Twitter the other day. Uh, some like Catholic housewife had become Orthodox because, you know, they couldn't they couldn't take fiducia supplicants. She and her husband, you know, not no theology background, no, no theological, ed, you know, education it's just people like well i can't square this in my own mind so like obviously it's the church that's wrong it's like well maybe you just don't understand something but people don't have that and they're being brought along by the talking hen pimps on the dissenting right like taylor marshall like peter kwasniewski who each time the church issues a document on kind of you know a fraught issue like that is on that that is trying to be pastoral and at the same time hold to orthodoxy. Each time a document like that comes out, you have the 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 hoi polloi, um, the masses who you know they don't have time to necessarily sit around and pour over church doc uh, documents and dissect every word and jot and tittle that the Holy Father or the DDF has said. Instead, they're like, give me the thirty minute v- uh, rundown on YouTube, and they're looking to like you know. Marshall or Kwasniewski or I guess this Holdsworth cat who, you know, again, marketing background. None of these guys have Catholic theology credentials, but they're out there. It's the blind leading the blind. And they're out there because it's it's sexy and it's it's um, novel to have a hot take on something that gets clicks. And so they're out there feeding people. Oh, the church is evil. The church is you know, the Pope is a heretic. And when is the College of Cardinals going to rise up and rebuke him? And and people are believing this, you know, their entertainment has has rotted their brains. I mean, that's something I see. So I think it's a very I mean, it's a deep point. And that that's a gutsy way of even putting it. I'll bet you get some pushback in the comments for that. But I think <laughs> I think that's an interesting point. Thanks. It, it's it's almost like, you know, some people may be setting up their parallel hierarchy like the, the you know the podcasting class they've kind of set up their like parallel MSNBC and CNN like they they they're the uh, they're the mainstream media of, of of Catholicism and I like going back to that those people that left you know for orthodoxy and like I'm hoping these these people actually look at the document at least read the text and uh, I used to I used to be you know like so certain in my like quote unquote traditional Catholic beliefs but I was just I was I was like I've done the research it's like no I just listen to podcasters so I, I would just encourage people to read the documents. Yeah. Uh, doing the research. Have you seen the meme where it's like I researched this myself and it's like each word has an asterisk by it. And I researched is like I watched. And then it's like <laughs> um, 
this and it's like, you know, I watch somebody else's crappy podcast or something, you know, <laughs> that, that's not research, you know, that's even if you think you've done research, you're like, well, I went and read this in the original Italian or Latin and, you know, I speak four languages and I'm a theologian. It's like, I assure you when it comes to the church problems with you, like if you find yourself dissenting from the church and saying um, on a regular basis that even the non-definitive magisterium of the Pope or the church is wrong. I promise you the problem is with you. Like, it's the Dirty Harry quote. A man's got to know his limitations. Man's got to know his limitations. And I feel like we're in an age of people who, we're in the age of hubris. You know? Like, well, I don't see how this could be true, so I'm going to become orthodox. Like, but you have a GED. What are you talking about? Like, what? why do you think, what basis do you have for judging uh, the, 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 the teaching of the sitting magisterium? What basis do you have for going to the church that Christ himself set up and sitting in judgment over it, over not just theologians, right? But theologians that have the grace of state, of of holy orders, of the fullness of holy, holy orders. And we're talking about, you know, bishops and cardinals and the pope. And then also the charism, if we're talking about the pope and the college of bishops speaking together, of being guided by the Holy Spirit. It takes some audacity, right? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely... Uh you know, pointing the finger to heaven and be like, you know, I have a philosophy degree from South City Community College, and I know better than you, God. <laughs> That's a great, uh, great line. Okay, but, you know, and I've had to retract some things that I have said in the past as well. And, and namely, you know, I look at the Pacamama stuff, um, where I was like, well, this is idolatry, you know, good for these guys for throwing this thing into, like, you know, the Tiber. Um, and saying that, you know, we, we should be punished institutionally because of this idolatry. And it looks like if you watch, especially the Lofton expose on that, all of the evidence points to, yeah, this was not idolatry. This is, um, people are essentially calling this a symbol of the Amazon or the Pope thought this was our lady of the Amazon. And they're just, you know, praying for the Amazon via imagery because we're having a synod about the amazon so of course you know i've gotten things wrong in the past i've had to eat humble pie had to eat crow everybody who's an honest man is going to have to come out and publish a retraction at some point because no one is impeccable um but you used to be more in the the rad trad wing of the church didn't you jake i did i i started going to latin mass around i think 2020 or 2021 right after covid and i started getting you know uh you know listening to podcaster and stuff and like oh man that there's so much wrong with the church and stuff and i think uh mine was like a lot of private conversations where you know i'd poke poke fun at the pope or something or you know listen to something he said in the most uncharitable light and you know kind of criticize him uncharitably with uh, my friends and then you know people who i hung out with i think the one time I did do something like publicly was on my YouTube channel. I think after Traditionis Custodis came out, um, I think it was in 2021. I think I put out a video on my YouTube channel where I had very, very harsh language towards the Pope. So I, I mean, I, I, I want to apologize that I want to take this time to say, I, I'm sorry to Pope Francis. I, I completely judged him the wrong way. I condemned him. I didn't give him the judgment of charity uh, the way I would want my words taken if if maybe I said something ambiguous or something. I didn't give that to him. And he's, you know, he's the vicar of Christ. He, he's owed that, like, almost more than than just, you know, some random guy on the street. So, you know, I, I apologize for that. And also, I apologize for having a schismatic mentality. I looked at the magisterium with, you know, a hermeneutic of suspicion. I'm like, no, I I know more than these guys. I'm a conser I'm a conservative. I'm an American conservative. I I know what we need to do. I know what we need to do. We need to pass this policy and this policy like it's a political game or something. But like, no, I'm I was wrong. I was I was definitely wrong. German, and that's again, that's a mark of a big man. Um, 
uh, of magnanimity to be able to 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 withdraw something that you've said and again kind of eat crow publicly. So um, and everybody's wrong. There's there's no actual shame in it. Actually, I think people um, those who are willing to admit when they're wrong and be like, hey, you know what I. Uh, owe you guys uh, an apology and a clarification so I don't give you scandal by leading you astray with my public statements. I'm sorry. That shows that you value truth more than you value your own uh, ego. And that's the mark of, of a good man. You know, bad men value themselves over the transcendentals of truth, good, um, and beauty. So, you know, it's a mark of a good man. And you know, thank you for saying that. I'm sure that's leading by example and other people who maybe said things that they should take back. You know, maybe they're going to take a leaf out of your book now. Um, okay. So then, I mean, that's a, that's a big recognition. You know, it's a big point of self-awareness that you've come to. Uh, it's a big transition, you know, kind of going from dissenting rad trad ideology uh, to, you know, just being a son of the church, an orthodox, humble son of the church who says, yes, the, the church is my mother, uh, mother and teacher, mater et magistra. Um, and, you know, I, I assent. I say, yes, even when I'm, I'm not sure of something that necessarily uh, the church has taught the basis for this teaching, I am going to have the spirit of fidelity and trust and ultimately faith. Uh, in the church because the church is set up by Jesus Christ and I have faith in that you know I have faith in the scriptures so because I have faith in holy writ and I believe that holy writ evidence is that the church is set up by Christ even when I don't understand what the church is saying I'm still going to have a belief in what the church is saying because I believe as a matter of faith that the church is set up by Christ and guided by him and uh, preserved by the Holy Spirit so um, yeah tell us how, what's up if I can real quick, um, I just wanted to, you know, clarify I was, I was never like, you know, like completely in the SSPX or like set of a contest or, or something. But I think, I think a lot of people think like, oh, if I, as long as I'm not in those groups then I'm, I'm good, but it's, it's really not, you need to, you need to have a spirit of docility and openness when you listen to the magisterium's teachings. And I also just want to like extend a hand to people that are kind of in, still in that mindset. It's like, it's not fun to apologize for sure, but you know, it's, it's not, the, it's not as hard as you think it might be. It's, it's actually very, like very cathartic and, you know, it makes it, it takes a weight off your shoulders. So just a, you know, a hand of friendship to people that are still like trapped in that mentality. Awesome. No, that is very kind and conciliatory of you. Absolutely. And what you said, you, you had several good points already and we're only 20 something minutes into the show. It takes a, a weight off your shoulders. You guys, the, it's the easiest thing in the world. Just be like, I don't know, but I trust the church. You know, heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? Like, so if you are the head, if you're the pope, then yeah, you've got a lot of weight on your shoulders because you are the vicar of Christ. You are the man sitting in for Christ as the visible head of his church on earth in the visible sign of unity in the church, which is what the church teaches about the pope. So I always get a kick. Up. I mean, I'm disgusted, but I get a kick out of it when pe people are like, well, the pope is schismatic. It's like, no, he's the sign of unity in the church, actually. But if you're just like, yeah, I submit to the church. There's nothing easier than that because it's like, I don't have to overthink everything. This is not, you know, and, and God bless a lot of our evangelical brothers because they're trying to be faithful um and they're getting a lot out of scripture even though they don't have the magisterium interpreting those scriptures for them uh with the guidance of the holy spirit um but they're still getting a lot out of scripture and uh there are many men of goodwill in evangelical circles but like you know people have gone down this evangelical route when it comes to interpreting like the the church and be like, well, it has to be something I figure out for myself. Uh, it has to be something where I parse every jot and tittle of scripture and, and come down with my own interpretation and I have to interpret the magisterium. It's like, no, just, you don't have to do that. Just trust the church, accept its conclusions. If you are a theologian or if you have facility in theology, then sure, make it, try to understand what the church is saying, but even if, if you run into a hiccup and you can't square the circle or, you know, then 
just trust the church. It's okay. So yeah, it's the easiest thing in the world to to get out of this dissenting um, hermeneutic of suspicion mindset. Uh, it's the easiest thing in the world to just be like, I assent. You know what? I'm a son of the church and I'm going to trust her like a mother. But how did you come to this, Jake? How did you come to this, to, to make the transition from where you were to where you are now? Yeah, the, um, I probably, you know, honestly, I, I, again, I'm not bashing these people, but just honest, about being honest, it's interacting with people in Latin mass parishes. It's, it's just like, Okay, all all you can talk about is G.K. Chesterton. You're you're dressing in tweed every day, and you're smoking a pipe like it's the 1850s. Like, I don't want to live. I don't want to LARP. I do not want to live in the 1800s. I was born in the I was born in the 1990s, and now it's the 21st century. I want to live in the 21st century, not the 19th. I'm sorry. Like, the church was not. It was not created in the 1800s. There. And it was supposed to stay there. It was. It's. It's living. It's a living thing. The people, in eight, the people that you're imitating from the 1800s, whenever they were in the 1800s, they weren't larping as like somebody from the 1200s. And somebody from the 1200s wasn't larping as somebody from the first century. It's like that's not how that's not how people operate. And I'm just like I don't. These like these people aren't fun to hang out with. Like I'm. I'm sorry. I'm sure they have. Those people have a ton of gifts. I'm sure that, you know, they know a lot and, and I'm sure they, to some extent they love Jesus. Um, but I, I, I don't want to be like those people. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just kind of well, what burden is it, to begin with. It's fair to say that you're seeing a lot of a lack of joy perhaps, and a lack of the fruits of the spirit that are coming out of some of these, uh, traditionalist hubs. Is that fair? People are dour there. Um, and it, it belies that maybe something is a bit off. Yeah, yeah, just just a, li- a little bit. I, I think it's not, you know, black and white. There are, there are plenty of people that, you know, go to FSSP and ICK that uh, that are really, like, fun fun to be around and, and stuff. But for the most part, I think people at, at those parishes, it's like all they can talk about is either, like, Pope Francis or, like, I remember just walking through from the bathroom to the... Uh, to the church and somebody was talking about like, this is why I don't like the sign of peace. And here's three reasons why da, 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 da. I'm like, dude, you're just, you're chopping it up with your friend. Like, can you talk about, you know, the ball game or like, you know, I don't know, something, something else like uh, the weather for goodness sakes, like, like just talk about something normal, like be a normal person, be somebody that other people that may not be in the church can relate to. And I think that's just that example would be, you know, a lot, a lot more evangelization than maybe, uh, trying to be mean to somebody on Twitter. Well, constantly hyper focusing and scrutinizing everything that the church is saying to try and find the fly in the ointment that can rub a lot of people the wrong way. And there is that element of people who have made Catholicism, not into their religion, but into their hobby. And, you know, they have to, they, they get their kicks from reading the next papal document and critiquing it. And that has created, uh, I would say, an unwholesome culture in some, again, hubs of traditional Catholicism, where now you have people where it just goes without saying, essentially. It's it's a foregone conclusion that, you know, the next papal document is going to have a problem with it. And even if you look at Desiderio Desideravi, a lot of people signed a letter accusing the Pope, the sitting Pope of heresy in Desiderio de Sideravi, saying that people could just receive the Eucharist without being in the state of grace was essentially their contention. And of course, he said and meant no such thing. And um, but basically every new papal document that comes out, there's you just expect it. You know, you would go to LifeSite News or to some extent, um, Catholic World Report, although they're much more balanced in their editorial angle, and you know they they still have a lot of really good content, also, which is more than can be said for LifeSite. Um, but you know, you go to these hubs of Catholicism and these media outlets, and you just expect that there's going to be a critique of 
of whatever. And of course, that goes with the the new liturgy, the the Novus Ordo as well. Um, well, I don't like the sign of peace. Well, did you know that the sign of peace was something that was in like the liturgy in year three hundred. Yeah, the kiss of peace. It wasn't shaking people's hands. It was even more intimate. Did you think of that? You know, that Greek (laughs) liturgy. Well, Latin's the mass of the ages. Really, I guess for the first 300 years when they had Greek liturgy, you know, only uh, before Latin mass, that wasn't the mass of the ages. Um, That one could change. But the the Latin, that's sacrosanct and can never, you know, never, ever change. Not that Latin should have been eradicated from the Novus Ordo in its entirety, of course. Sacrosanctum Concilium says it should be preserved, and it should be preserved. And one of the weaknesses of the new iteration of the Mass, at least in its implementation, is, of course, the lack of mat, uh, Latin, the lack of Gregorian chant, the lack of organ, yada, yada, yada. So I'm not saying things are perfect, but I'm sick of hearing all of the critiques instead of people's focus and being on Christ and the Eucharist, who's in the tabernacle every week. Um, and the words of consecration and the infinite graces you have right at your fingertips in the mass. Again, is it the dower element, Jake, that, that's putting you off? Cause I think that's fair. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's, that pretty much sums it up. The dower. Okay. Well, what, I mean, but you've had a seemingly an ideological and theological evolution. Um, you know, what sparked that? Obviously, Maybe some of the seeds of doubt were sown because you saw uh, the fruits of this kind of dissenting rad trad mindset at play. But like what actually gave you the intellectual uh, stimulation that you needed to move your will in the direction that it has? Right. So, I mean, just kind of, you know, like I said, inter- having interacting with people on a personal level kind of kind of pushed me away a little bit. And then I kind of was like, okay, I don't want to end up like this, so I'm not going to behave this way, but I'm still going to believe all this stuff, you know, privately. Um, and then, you know, as, as time went on and I kept seeing, you know, people take uh, Pope Francis's words out of context and this and that, I'm like, okay, I need to retrace my steps here. And, and really, uh, I got to give credit to Michael Lofton. I, I started, uh, I remember him being interviewed by Church Militant right after, like, like you said, I was there with you right after I left church militant he got interviewed and i was like oh i was like oh isn't that that guy that like isn't he the one that like is a pope splainer for lack of a better word and i was like okay i'm gonna give this guy a chance because i work there and i trust the people at church militant and so then i took a look at him and i was like oh man like he all he does is point to the magisterium like he's in a very humble way points to the magisterium and like knows all these all the documents and where to find it and i was like Oh, dang. Like, I really, okay, I really got to retrace my steps now. And so I went back and I was thinking about, like, all all the, you know, all the scandals, like, the like you said earlier, the Pachamama stuff, like, who am I to judge situation, um, and just go down the list. And I, I kind of, I watched a lot of uh, uh, Michael's um, videos on the topics, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I had Pope Francis all wrong. I had him completely wrong. Like, Maybe he does imprudent stuff sometimes, but no, I, I was just reading headlines and, and the way the, you know, the left wing media smears Trump and I like Trump. I was like, the Catholic media is smearing Pope Francis. And I, I was like, I can't believe I fell for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, it's easy to fall for Jake um, because it's a wall of commentary and duplicitous reporting every time he says something so it's not like you know it's just a trickle or you know one article here and an article there it seems to be almost monolithic uh, that when the pope says something on a topic that is a little bit edgy whether it's you know homosexual couples if he's trying to be pastoral with them or divorced and remarried couples and he's trying to be pastoral with them or if he's trying to clarify you know access to the eucharist and uh when the the eucharist should be withheld and whatnot um every time he's being read by i'd say like a majority of outfits that we previously trusted uh in a way that's just does violence to the actual black letter of what he said. So it's easy to fall into that. 
Um, especially again, if you're not like a, a professional Catholic commentator or something, and you don't have all day to just pour over a document, but you have to like work and do important things and provide for your family and be immersed in your vocation of being, you know, a husband or father or wife or mother, uh, all that stuff, you know, it's easy to get swept away by the current, um, by the cataclysm of, of, stuff that's very anti Pope Francis and that really does lack journalistic and editorial integrity. It's a real problem. And there are very few doing what Lofton's doing. And I think, um, well, it's one thing, you know, that we try to do on this channel, uh, is, is just show people that, yeah, the, the Pope can be trusted. And all these times you've been saying the wrong things about the Pope. Well, you know, you were wrong and therefore you should be doubting the next time when you are tempted to be carried away by the anti-Francis current. Because, again, I mean, there's more stuff that comes out. There's more irresponsible journalism and commentary that comes out than people have time to refute. Right. That's one of the problems. Like all we can do is punch punch holes in like some of the most mainstream anti-Francis theories, but you can't shoot them all down because they're, they're just too many. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's, that's spot on. Um, it's kind of, it reminds me of, I mean, there's so many, par there's so many parallels between this and politics. It's just, it's just crazy, but it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, uh, almost before Roe v. Wade was overturned, it seemed kind of it seemed kind of bleak. It was like, okay, this has been decided several times with uh, you know Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and of course Roe v. Wade in 1973. And it's like it seemed, everything seemed pretty bleak. It's like we're never going to get this overturned. It's really we just got to you know one person at a time mentality. We, if we can just change like one heart and mind, then maybe that person uh, won't either get an abortion or pay for one. And I feel like that's almost the mentality we kind of got to take with this. Maybe that might be the best strategy. It's like almost everybody we know, it seems, has been hoodwinked by like Catholic media that's like has their finger on the pulse. And it's kind of you just got to like sit down and you got to love them. It's like build a relationship with them. And I think Pope Francis talks about, you know, accompanying people like accompany these people back into the church. I, I think that might be the only way to go about it. Well, slowly also discrediting by showing how they're just wrong and demonstrably wrong. And what they've said is demonstrably false when you compare it with, you know, how the document actually reads. And hopefully we reach a critical mass of that where people just stop taking, uh, again, the Catholic entertaining pimps so seriously and it, they lose their sway. And it's like in chemistry with titration where you like drop a drop of that pink stuff in. Um, and it doesn't change the color of the solution, but then with like one final drop, the whole thing goes pink. I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that's kind of what happens. Like the light bulb clicks on for people and they're like, oh, wow. You know, the American Catholic commentary class on the right has been disgustingly irresponsible. And I'm like waking up to realize that, you know? Um, okay. So let's pivot then. Um, unless there's anything else you want to say about like how you how the light bulb clicked on for you uh, in this regard. I mean, obviously, Lofton was important, and he's been somewhat prophetic out there, being like one of the lone voices crying in the wilderness. Like, no, you guys, like, look, you got to read this in context. You you can't do violence to the text of this document. You have to uh, um, understand that the Pope is is speaking in continuity with his forebears, not in rupture or against his forebears. Um, and here's what he really meant, and just doing the legwork. Uh, so I know he was an important influence. Anything else that, that brought uh, you along? Probably just the the rhetoric of the rad trads, like calling Pope Francis a heretic, or he's not the Pope, or we're gonna throw him in the ocean, like that sort of thing. Really pushed me off, and then I just read primary sources. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. You read the actual documents. Because with fiducia supplicants, I really don't see how people read the document and are bothered by it. Oh, well, the Pope says you can bless homosexual couples. Yeah, he says you can pray for them to conform their life and relationship to Christ. Like, oh, the horror. 
you know, like <laughs> no one who reads the document is actually going to be bothered. And they also don't understand what like a prefatory clause is or like incorporation by reference. This document actually incorporates by reference all of the church's prior teaching on this matter in the introduction, right? Um, because it's like, well, we're not changing the church's teaching on marriage at all. We're not changing anything with the, the church's teaching. All we're doing is putting a finer point on when non-liturgical blessings can be given. And we're saying specifically in this context, as long as it is not uh, essentially an affirmation of this disordered relationship, but you're praying for people to be more Christ-like, well, then you can give them. Well, sure, that's a development in the praxis of the church when it comes to blessings. But yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Read the document, you guys, because these things, so much could be circumvented if people would just do what is responsible before commenting on things like this and actually read the document. I, what We've turned Pope bashing into a cottage industry. They call us, us Pope pope splainers like first of all that's called being a catholic but there's nothing profitable about being a pope splainer you know it's profitable to set yourself up as a living prophet um and then people are gonna divert their funds over to you because you just have all the answers well like guys i don't have all the answers but i can read a document and i you know have read many of the church's past documents and i can uh show you how this is continuous and not a rupture with previous documents Okay, so let's pivot then. Um, you already talked a little bit about why you wrote the document um, on where Peter is. Anything else you want to say about this article uh, that's titled Response to Cardinal Mueller's Claims on Fiducia Supplicants? Anything else you want to, uh, you know, preface your, your motives, uh, your, the thoughts behind it before we actually get into the substance of the matter? Yeah, the why, the why to, you know, the why to the what was, was basically, I was like, okay, this has led some friends astray. And I think I drafted something and sent it to a couple of friends that maybe they read it, maybe they didn't. Um, a couple of people reached out and they're like, okay, this kind of makes more sense. I, I remember my family, uh, they were kind of concerned about fiducia supplicans as well. Uh, and I was like, no, 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 it's not, it's not what the media is saying. It's, it's all right. It's all right. Turn the fire alarm off. We're, we're, we're going to be all right. Sort of thing. So yeah, that's, that's basically the, the motive. Okay. Now, Jake, before we get into it again, are you a liberal? Cause this is, this is the funny thing. People have been so brainwashed by like the, the false dichotomy of left and right in the church and you know republican politics and democrat politics especially in america which is why uh the rhetoric in america with regard to pope francis is the most extreme worldwide like that's the reason is because we have a two-party system and everything is basically bifurcated into uh right is right and left is wrong are I've been told I'm a liberal. It's like, you guys, I'm hard right. I was in college Republicans. You know, I did stuff with like Leadership Institute. Um, you know, I was doing pro-life stuff when I was uh, in college. Uh, Y'all are crazy. Like, I'm hard right in my politics. Hey, you know, voted. Yeah, I'm not even going to go through the credentials. Just absolutely hard right. But people will still be like, you liberal. Because I don't want to call like the sitting pope a heretic, which is asinine. But are you a liberal, Jake? No, I am not. I'm about as far right as you can get, Dave. Okay. I mean, yeah. Sorry, I, keep going. I voted for Trump twice, and you know what? Uh, uh, I'm not going to say this, but if I did, I would say that uh, if Trump got in there and he stayed, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be the. I wouldn't be the most mad person in the whole world. We'll put it that way. Um, but I'm about, yeah, about as far right as you can get politically. So you're not, like, seeking to usher in, like, the Soros, uh, you know, World Economic Forum, uh, New World Order agenda. You're not, like, a secret agent against the church or something like that, the way they accuse, like, Lofton and, you know, other uh, quote-unquote pope splainers of being. I, I wish I, I wish I was that important, Dave. It sounds it sounds like pretty exciting to be, you know, like a secret agent or something, but unfortunately not. It's a shame that people confuse disciplined thinking and nuance 
with giving in or somehow being soft on uh, theology or politics. It, it's just not the case, you guys. You have to think with nuance and you have to make distinctions. And not everybody who's on your side, like in terms of like voting at the ballot box, is going to be theologically precise and accurate and worthy of an opinion. And even people who, you know, hold uh, hue to traditional Catholic morality and, you know, they do have faith. They do have uh, theological faith. They do, of course, believe in the real presence. You got to, we're, we're in a place where you have to understand that those very people might be in like mortally sinful dissent against the Pope, either out of, out of ignorance and temerity, you know, running their mouths in rash judgment uh, without um, having due cause and, and even, you know, error. Uh, ignorance and error. You have to understand that those people might not be your friends theologically, even though they see eye to eye with you on 95% of things theologically and politically. Like people are having a hard time with that. Um, oh, this conservative theologian said something against the Pope. It must be safe to say things against the Pope. No, that's not how it works, you guys. Um, again, the canon, uh, 1404, no one judges the first C. Uh, just check your canon law, y'all. Uh, canon 1404. First C is judged by no one. And that's, uh, I mean, did you grapple with that? Because you wrote your essay. You wrote your article on where Peter is as a response to Cardinal Mueller, who was very critical of Pope Francis and came out swinging in his pillar essay. Is that something you grappled with? Because he is a cardinal. He does have grace of state. This is the former head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Um, did you grapple with how you were going to, to issue this rebuke, what you were going to say? Um, I mean, what went into that thought process, Jake? Yeah, I, I definitely, definitely grapple is a, is a great word to use. Um, I'm like, who, who am I? I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm just somebody on YouTube. I'm somebody, uh, I'm just a random person, uh, you know, rebuking the former prefect for the, for this, <laughs> out of the DDF. And I was, I wrote this thing out, you know, privately. I didn't think I was going to publish it anywhere. And then I, you know, I, I believe I sent it to my family and they're like, okay, this, this is pretty good. And it was more like in-person talks and, you know, like, okay, that makes sense. And I was like, okay, maybe this could help. Maybe this could help other people. Um, before I submitted it, I was thinking, I was like, I don't want to. I do not want to attack, you know, a cardinal of, of the church. I don't want to do what the rat trads do to Pope Francis. I don't want to do what they do uh, to Cardinal Mueller. But it was it. It was. Um, I, I really wanted. I, I saw people being led astray by this, and I wanted to wanted to try and help. And you know, Canon. Canon 212 really uh, helps helps me as well. It's like you're you're allowed to you know critique. You just have to you have to do it with with filial reverence and with with respect. So I, I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind here. And and honestly, just anybody when you're, I think it's easy to forget. Um, like I worked in Catholic media. Just even if it's not a cardinal, when you're writing, when you're like you know criticizing somebody publicly, it's like if you mess up. In a, in a like a really big way, then you got to publicly apologize for it. So it's like, you know, it's kind of a kind of a little nerve wracking putting that out there, but it's definitely something I grappled with. Sure. Well, I think it is important to note something here. Um, and that's a lot of people think that because something is coming from a cardinal or like Archbishop Vigano said this schismatic thing this week, or, you know, Father James Altman said this awful foul mouth thing against the pope this week so i can say that too or cardinal Mueller said this thing uh against the holy see this week so therefore i'm allowed to to parrot that to to kind of mindlessly regurgitate that as well and guys that's not the case all these prelates who are coming out against the holy see they're wrong like it's not a defense so the cardinal can can come out and accuse the pope of heresy no, he can't. Like, he's wrong to do that. Do you understand? And this is just from Christus Dominus, uh, a Vatican II document. Um, it, it says this, and I'm going to just read it, because this is the Pope's relationship to the bishops and the College of Bishops. He's still the head, you guys. 
you the the bishops individual bishops are not allowed to defy the pope they're not allowed to take matters into their own hands the pope still has this universal supreme uh, authority over the church and that can't be contravened by um, bishops they are still under the headship of the pope so a lot of people have this asterisk um this kind of exception carved out in their mind that like bishops can just come accuse a sitting pope of heresy no no one judges a sitting pope not even bishops now as a cardinal you are an advisor to the pope so you could go to him in private and say you know um your holiness i'm grappling with this issue i don't see how to square this circle um can you maybe give me some guidance or will you like as in the dubia uh issue a clarification to what you meant by this because i feel like there's a problem here you can do that you can go to him privately and do that but you know to come out and accuse the holy see the pope um rome of falling into the darkness of heterodoxy and heteropraxy that's a whole other matter and Mueller is out of line for writing this essay that's the thing like don't take solace in the fact a cardinal has done something that's just like seeing somebody uh if you saw bill gates like jump off a bridge and you're like well bill gates did it and he's pretty important <laughs> so i guess i'm gonna jump off the bridge too like that's really what you're doing like no Mueller is in error for this and don't follow him this is christus dominus uh second section in this Church of Christ, the Roman pontiff, as the successor of Peter, to whom Christ entrusted the feeding of his sheep and lambs, enjoys supreme, full, immediate, and universal authority over the care of souls by divine institution. Therefore, as pastor of all the faithful, he is sent to provide for the common good of the universal church and for the good of the individual churches. Hence, he holds a primacy of ordinary power over all the churches. The bishops themselves, however, having been appointed by the Holy Spirit, are successors of the apostles as pastors of souls, together with the supreme pontiff, and under his authority, they are sent to continue throughout the ages the work of Christ, the eternal pastor. Under his authority. So Mueller's not allowed to just come out and smack uh, the Ducia supplicants because, you know, it doesn't make sense to him. You know, he as a cardinal could approach the Holy Pontiff in a way that, you know, Jake, you and you and I could not. But, you know, to go public with it and as you bring up in the article, and I think you mentioned earlier in the show, that's that's exactly uh, what you're not supposed to do if you're having a problem giving this, you know, kind of intellectual assent to what what the Holy See has taught. Yeah, um, yeah, I talk in my article, I, I quoted uh, Donum Veritatis, paragraph 30, and I'll just read it real quick. Um, it says, in cases like these, the theologian should avoid turning to the quote-unquote mass media, but have recourse to the responsible authority. For it is not by seeking to exert the pressure of public opinion that one contributes to the clarification of doctrinal issues and renders servite to the truth, um, end quote. So I believe that applies to you know, it talks about theologians, but I believe in this case it applies to uh, Cardinal Mueller as well. And it, it, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's usually standard practice that they, if they did have a dubia about this, that they would submit it privately. They want to automatically turn to the media to, you know, rally up the faithful and, and, and promote dissent. Right. The church is not a democracy. That's what a lot of Americans can't get this through their head. We've we've had it so like forced into our head all you know the consent of the governed and all of this uh you know that's it's central to who we are. So we're a very we have this very democratic mindset where it's like, well, I don't like this. It's like, well, it doesn't matter what you like or what a, a majority of Catholics really think. It's just truth is truth whether one person believes it or whether everybody believes it. And there's that great Archbishop uh, Fulton Sheen quote on that exact thing. Like, the truth doesn't care about how many people agree with it or not. Uh, we are, Catholicism is the most objective morality in the universe, you know, because truth is not just a thing for us, it's a person. 
and whatever falls outside the divine essence and the divine mind is something that is untrue. Um, and you know, we can't give our assent to that. So yeah. Um, and, and Dave, I just wanted to really quickly add, it's like, you know, democracies are like a political system. They're not, they're not sacred either. I mean, our, we have a Republic, but just, I think that, yeah, the American idea of like democracy is sacred. We have to protect our democracy, all that, that sort of thing. I'm reminded of, I think there was this Muslim guy on TV. He was at the UN or somewhere. It was, maybe he was an Iraq official or something. And he was reading something. And he was like, democracy is by the people for the people, but the people are retarded. <laughs> <laughs> and in this case, I, I think it, it, it applies. We don't, we don't want a democracy. Uh, we, we've seen how crazy democracy can get in the political world. We definitely don't want a democracy in the church. Right. It would be super corrupt if the pontiff, if the magisterium uh, was making decisions based on popular appeals. Do you guys understand how dangerous that would be? Because the world is against us. The world is against Christ. You know, the world first rejected him. Uh, so it's going to reject us, too. The world is not our friends. So if we talk about like. If we want this kind of populism in the church and we're making use of the tools of populism and like trying to get the magisterium to move on something uh, by recourse to the mass media and by kind of leaning on them and using um, the, the stick of popular opinion to get them to move, that's very dangerous because the world is going to be, you know, it's easy to get a majority of worldlings then to lean on the church and get it to embrace the gospel of the world, which is of course the anti-gospel. But guys, be reminded, be reminded. Uh, and Donum Veritatis has a very important line in there. It's uh, section 17 where it says, for the same reason, magisterial decisions in matters of discipline, even if they are not guaranteed by the charism of infallibility, are not without divine assistance and call for the adherence of the faithful. So you can't even say, well, this is a matter of discipline and like, you know, papal prudence. Therefore, I'm going to say, you know, forget what Francis has said here. Um, you can just tune him out. Uh, so Mueller can't even lean on that because this even in matters of discipline, the church is guided by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Father is guided by the Holy Spirit in a way that Mueller, that <laughs> obviously, like you and I, are not. Um, so, just throwing that out there. Okay, so you you took an interesting tack with your article, and I think it was a smart one uh, as a writer. I think it's a good path. Um, you, you made it very digestible to people. You basically made it three parts. And you broke down Mueller's argument, Cardinal Mueller's argument in his essay with the pillar into three basic contentions, um, essentially. Uh, but I mean, is that fair to say? Uh, it looks like the, the three contentions are um, blessings are novel and have no precedent. Homosexual unions are what is actually being blessed and the document itself is self-contradictory. And then you attack those. Why Why'd you take that tack? Why did you go with that um, that structure for your essay? You know, just the just the way my my brain works, honestly, Dave, I like to, you know, get to the core of something like I see, especially when I remember studying in school, I would, you know, do vocabulary words and I'd be like, OK, that word doesn't need to be here. This word doesn't need to be here. Let's get to the core of what we're talking about. So I read Mueller's article a couple of times and then those three things really stuck out to me. And I was like, let's drill down to the core of what he's saying and kind of, you know, get rid of the rest. And that's those are the things I I kind of uh, went after in my article. OK, so you say um, his first claim, the blessings are novel and have no precedent. Uh, so let's let's go uh, from that um, that point first. What, what do you mean that? Cardinal Mueller is claiming that these blessings of homosexual couples are novel and that they have no precedent. So, yeah, I, uh, I, in my article, I admit, you know, Cardinal Mueller is correct. These blessings are novel, like, but in, in a sense, he is correct. But that was the reason for the document was they were issuing clarifications and they did create a new category for pastoral blessings. That was partially the reason for the document. So, yeah, like, Yes, they're novel. That's why the document was issued. 
the precedent part was he was he was talking about how there's no scriptural uh, precedent for this, and um, he said, "Well, uh, Fiducia doesn't give uh, give us enough uh, scriptural precedent for it." But Fiducia talks about in paragraphs 14 through 19, it talks about nothing but scriptural precedent. It talks about what a blessing is, uh, different parts in the Bible where blessings were given. And, you know, it, it goes into detail about how there's a ascending aspect of a blessing, like a praise to God and a descending aspect of God's gifts upon something. And it, it completely lays it out. So I just thought on both counts there, the novel part, it's like, yeah, OK, it is novel, but that's the whole reason for this on the precedent part. FS lays it out perfectly. It lays out the scriptural precedent. So I thought he was wrong on both accounts there. Well, what's his point? So let's say that, you know, this particular thing, giving blessings to homosexual couples to live better, to live more Christ-like, essentially to calling them to repent. That's something that has never gotten the formal imprimatur by the church. But what's his point? Like who, who cares? Okay, so it's novel. There's a lot of things that are novel, but that doesn't mean they're heterodox or that they res- represent heteropraxy. Right, right. It, I think he's, I think he's missing. With all due respect to the his eminence, I think he's missing. You know the, you know the usual talk about. Well, is is it changing doctrine or is is doctrine developing? And and I think he, I think he thinks that you know a teaching has been changed, like it's okay to be gay now or something, or like we're blessing, we're blessing uh, gay people for the acts they commit. It's like, no, if you just read the document, it's, it's very clear. That's not what's, that's not what's going on. It's not an affirmation of what they're doing. It's, it's saying, Hey bros, don't be gay anymore. Come to Christ. Yeah. I mean, let's read from the intro It is precisely in this context that one can understand the possibility of blessing couples in irregular situations and same-sex couples without officially validating their status or changing in any way the church's perennial teaching on marriage, i.e. that all sexual activity outside of marriage is disordered, by the way. So, we're just incorporating this by reference. We are now saying, and again, you can do this in the law, You can say in a legal opinion or, you know, a motion is so that I don't have to write up this entire fact pattern in this motion that's before the court again, that I am incorporating by reference all of the facts that have already been stated before the court and that we just have an understanding that they're now part of this motion. But I'm not going to reiterate them because that would be labor intensive and redundant and, and silly a waste of my time. The church is doing that here. We're not validating people's statuses who are in illicit, uh, immoral unions or quasi-unions, and we're not changing the church's teaching on marriage. That said, okay, so now it's this document, Fiducia Supplicans, should now read as if all of the church's moral theology were part of its preface. All of the church's teaching on um, marriage is part of its preface, right? Like... The, the church specifically says, the, the DDF specifically says, we're not changing things and we're not validating things. So why are people doing this? Why is Cardinal Mueller, who's a very educated man, uh, m- much more so than I am, um, why is he doing this? Why, why would he take this tack and see the novelty here as uh, heterodox novelty, as opposed to, sure, we're extending what's always been part and parcel of the deposit of faith now to these situations at the margins so that we can draw people who are living uh, disordered and wicked lives into the heart of the church. Yeah, I I don't, I can't speak for Cardinal Mueller's intentions or his, his motivations, but his actions at least are, like we've, like we said, they're, they're not, they're not okay. <laughs> they're not all right. Um, in issuing this essay, um, I think, uh, I don't know, my best guess is either he, he doesn't know, and I, I want to give him the judgment of charity and, and think that either he doesn't, doesn't know these things, even though it's hard to believe, or he's, you know, closed off to them. Like he doesn't, no matter how many clarifications are given, he doesn't want to hear it because maybe he's, it's a sunk cost fallacy. He's in, he's in too deep. Sure. Okay. So let me, let me ask this because you you incorporate his claim 
um, in into your to your kind of rebuke your essay uh, rebuking him. And he says this, a first observation is that there's no basis for this new usage in the biblical text cited by uh, FS, nor in any previous statement of the magisterium. You, we just addressed that, so we don't need to rehash it too much. But he goes on to say, nor do the texts offered by Pope Francis provide a basis for this new type of blessing. For already the blessing, according to the Roman ritual, allows a priest to bless someone who lives in sin. So he's saying that, like, you know, priests can already bless people who are living in sin. So therefore, this must be something more. This must be pushing the envelope further than what we actually see in the church right now. And therefore, it must almost be an extension of, you know, we're, we're kind of walking back our doctrine. We are caving in on our doctrine and we're blessing the union itself as opposed to these people, the couple. Um I mean, what do you think? How how do you respond? Yeah, I think I think that I mean, I think he brings up a good point. It's like, well, why do we need this if, if nothing's changed uh, doctrinally? But uh, yeah, I mean, in the liturgical setting, um, you know, you, we do bless bless sinners all the time. But a question existed. And I mean, Mueller himself is somebody who has been asking for clarification several times, if I'm not mistaken. The question existed. OK, if we can bless one sinner, can we bless two? Can we bless two sinners that present themselves at the same time? Can we bless those people? Or, you know, we had to like take turns and like, okay, you go stand over in the corner and then you can come over or can just a, you know, a same sex couple come up and be like, Hey father, can you pray for us? And then he, the priest in good conscience now can say, yes, I I bless in the name of the father, son, and the Holy spirit go and sin no more. Um, so I think it, I really, I think it really comes down to that. Uh, and with regard to, you know, if it's if I think people are getting hung up on the word couple and union for some reason, it's like magically overnight, those words have become synonyms for each other when before that wasn't really the case. Like uh, I said in my article that, you know, let's apply that logic to, you know, a heterosexual couple. So if if, you know, like two people that are cohabitating before marriage, they're not they're living in scandal they're not living in the best situation. If they come up and ask the priest after mass for a blessing, does that mean that we have to deny them a blessing? Because, you know, what unites them, you know, they're a couple and using Mueller's logic, if if they're a couple, then the thing that's that binds them together is the union. Then are we blessing the sinful union of them living or cohabitating? And I don't I don't I don't think that's true. I don't think we have to deny them that blessing. And, you know it's kind of a norm in the church now. And I mentioned this in my article as well, that in some cases, priests, you know, they, they help people that are cohabitating. They help legitimatize that uh, relationship by getting married in the church. They don't just send them away. It's like you cohabitated. Now you can never get married in the church. It's like, no, they help normalize that situation. So I think it's really easy to get out of that, you know, uh, place where we've boxed ourselves in there by just applying it to a heterosexual couple. And, it, all the doubts kind of fade away. Well, sure, sure. Also, the idea that, okay, we already can bless somebody who's dealing with a specific type of sin, who's living in a certain kind of sin in their life, like a drug user or something like this. What's novel about this is it's extending the ability to bless to people who are sinning with each other. So you wouldn't like bless, you know, a crackhead and his crack pipe, because the crack pipe is, you know, it's not a person. You're not calling the crack pipe to repentance. What's unique about a homosexual couple or a divorced and remarried couple living in an irregular union is that these people are sinning with each other. So the question is, okay, well, can you now bless two people together who are sinning with each other insofar as that blessing is ordered towards their repentance and conversion of heart? That is not something that is applicable where we're talking about the Roman ritual allows a priest to bless uh, a, somebody who's addicted to drugs. Because now we're talking about uh, people who are committing a sin together. Well, this is the development here. Yes, you can now bless. It, it's now expressly clear that you can bless people who are um, sinning together. Not the sin itself, not the relationship itself, but you can bless those people together 
and pray for the repentance and conversion of heart. So this is, again, a legitimate development because now that has been made clear. And I, and I think you make a great point in your response, in your essay, in where Peter is, because you're essentially like, well, you know, um, Cardinal Mueller, you're talking about this uh, if, as if there would be no reason to say, yes, you can do these blessings because su- blessings already exist. Um, blessings for people who live in sin already exist. It's like, well, then why'd you issue all the deep dubia? Why did you green light all, yeah. all of these dubia? Why do you applaud all these dubia going to Pope Francis asking for clarification? If it's so clear and these blessings already exist in the Roman ritual for people who live in sin to his own point, then then what's the need for you approaching the Holy See and being like, Holy Father, will you clarify? So it seems like he has made a disingenuous argument here because he himself has asked for clarifications, but then he's saying, well, the matter's already clear in the Roman ritual, so obviously we're changing things for the worse and we're embracing heterobraxy and heterodoxy uh, because otherwise we just say, hey, the Roman ritual is clear. It's like, you're the one who's saying, you know, you're the one who's asking for, for clarity on this matter. Yeah, you ask. It's like it's like you asked. It's like, hey, why are you doing this? You asked, <laughs> right? It's like, um, it's like, okay. And even going back to twenty twenty one, they issued a a clarification on it, and they weren't happy with that. So then they asked more questions. You're gonna get, as you know, as you ask questions, you're gonna get more into the minutia and stuff. And then you're like, I don't like this minutia. It's like, okay, you shouldn't have asked. Just <laughs> be happy with what you got. No, totally. And they already made it clear you can't bless the unions uh, in, again, the 2021 document. They said expressly you cannot bless sin. It's not okay to bless sin. So then why do they think two years later the Vatican has changed its mind? Again, this is people, they're getting too used to politicians and the weaklings and the Chris Christies of the world and like evolving in their stances uh, and really capitulating. It's not like that. This is the church. The church just issued a document saying that you can't bless sin and that you can't bless these unions. So this new document must be read in a way to harmonize it with the old document. Not Don't read the new document in a way that it overrides the two-year-old document as if the Vatican is like schizophrenic <laughs> or as if there's a new sheriff in town and they're going to change everything all up because it's a new head of the DDF. That's not how it works in the church. These two documents must be read and harmonized. And it's just what you said. The previous document was more general and this is more specific. So unions can't be blessed. You cannot bless sin. But in specific cases, and again, fiducia supplicant says it's up to like the priest's pastoral prudence. It's not like you must bless these sinful uh, couples. It's if the priest in his pastoral discretion sees that this couple is of goodwill and is coming for a blessing to be more Christ-like, uh, i.e., you know, to, to repent of this sin, then he can give a blessing. Uh, but these people are reading these things to conflict, which is, it violates all the canons of statutory interpretation, uh, everything that you would learn as like a lawyer in your first year of practice, that the courts read statutes together. They don't read statutes to conflict unless there is an irreconcilable difference. So the, the courts will do everything they can to reconcile two documents. These are easily reconcilable. You can't bless the unions. You can bless the couples insofar as the blessing is ordered towards um, a, a repentance and conversion of heart. For sure. For sure. And I, yeah, just going, going on your point of it. Yeah. It's like they're, they're getting hung up because it's like, okay, this contradicts, you know, uh, with the, uh, responses from 2021. It's like, it's written in a different way. It's written in a different way. They say different words. It's like, yeah, because it's a clarification of that document. So it's, I think the, I think the criticism here, unfortunately, it misses the mark. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so he says that, you know, the, the, the second point that you critique, he's saying that homosexual unions are what is actually being blessed. Um, Jake, what say you? Are homosexual unions what is actually being blessed? 
Well, I'll turn to the document itself, if you don't mind. Um, all right, quote, such is also the meaning of the responsum of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which states that the church does not have the power to impart blessings on unions of persons of the same sex. FS paragraph five. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't really have much to add there. <laughs> the, if you read the text, it answers it itself. Yeah, let, let me go the sentence before what you read, too. I think that's worth uh, pointing out to the audience. For this reason, when it comes to blessings, the church has the right and the duty to avoid any right that might contradict this conviction or lead to confusion. And then it goes into what you said, saying that we've already said you can't bless these unions because that would be uh, a violation of our duty to not sow confusion or undermine um, the reality of the church's teaching on sexuality. Like, so I, it's right there. It's in black <laughs> and white, man. I don't get it. Like, my mind is blown. Cardinal Mueller, very bright man. You know, like the pit bull for essentially, um, you know, Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, a bastion of orthodoxy, it seemed. What's he missing? I don't get it. Like, explain this to me. What's hard about this? I... I don't know. Like I said, I don't want to get in his psychology. Um, I'm thinking. I don't. I don't know. I think. I. I hope. I. I hope he. He thinks he's doing the right thing here. I. He was in 2017. I remember he was. Uh, you know, defending Amoris Laetitia. Laetitia for a while, if I'm not mistaken. And I. Uh, I. For some reason, he's he's cha- had a change of heart. Maybe hopping on the bandwagon with the other Cardinals. You know, there's five or six other Cardinals out there that kind of do the, kind of pull the same shenanigans that he does. And I don't know, maybe it's the, the, the kind of a boys club that they, they want to be a part of now. And they get the, they get the headlines, they get the uh, press from uh, Catholic, all the, all the Catholic media outlets, but I'm, I'm not going to say that's the reason why, but I know, I know he's a smart man. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these guys, it seems like they get their 15 minutes of fame and they just want to cling on to it. Remember, it was like Cardinal v- Vigano wrote this one letter and now it's like Cardinal Vigano is issuing his, you know, hourly missive about things that are way outside his pay grade in the New World Order conspiracy to weaponize COVID. Like, what say you, uh, Vigano, uh, Archbishop Vigano? Um, it, it's weird. These guys get their 15 minutes of fame and then they just seem to go off the deep end. Either that or it's a confirmation bias. Um, they're watching, you know, the silly podcasts out there that are assigning bad motives to the Pope with everything he does. And they've just, I guess, been melded by their own spiritual children. All these laymen with podcasts out there that are qu- uh, constantly questioning the Pope and the magisterium ironically seem to be acting as formators of the actual magisterium itself or not the magisterium but individual members of the hierarchy of the church are actually being fed pathetically by you know the lay experts that don't have theology training or degrees (laughs) what is that yeah that's it's crazy i i wish i it's got to stop like i think you know, uh, somebody wants to look for a culprit here, and it's all—it's been Pope Francis for like the last ten years now, it seems. But it's like I think I think it's finally time we turn. You know, we uh, we turn that scrutiny, we turn that magnifying glass um, the other way around, and be like, I think it's Catholic media, guys. I think it's Catholic media. They don't enjoy the same protections the church does. They don't enjoy um, you know charisms of the Holy Spirit like the church does, and a lot of times their, you know, their intentions aren't, aren't, aren't the best. I'll just, I'll say it that way. They want, they, you know, they want donors, they want clicks. They want things like that, that aren't, aren't the most purest of motives in, in the church with its, uh, you know, in, you know, of course, uh, private lives of the bishops and the Pope are different from their, their public ministry. But with the Pope and bishops, we do not have to have to have the same worry. We don't have to have the same, like, oh, am I being lied to? Are they, are they are, are they leading me to hell? Um, we don't have to have that same uh, worry about uh, the church like we do Catholic media. So I think I think it's time we look at Catholic media, maybe in a in a bit more uh, of a critical light. 
Okay, so let me ask. Homosexual unions are what is actually being blessed. I mean, how does he derive that? Since it's against the black letter of the actual document itself, where is he? How is he coming to this conclusion? Why is he saying this? Again, he's a smart man. So, you know, how is he confident enough in that to to write an essay and publish it on the pillar? I think it goes back to, uh, you know, un- not understanding the difference between couple and union. And I think that's really what his his piece uh, rests its arguments on, because the uh, I think he also accused the uh, uh, document of being self-contradictory. But that, too, rests on the idea that couple and union are inextricably linked. Like. I, I don't know. I don't know when those two words started meaning the same thing, but I think it was December 18th, 2023. Sure. OK, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, then uh, shall we pivot uh, to the third claim? It's self-contradictory, which you just references. Um, he says that it follows that as long as Pope Francis con- continues to affirm that homosexual unions are always contrary to God's law, he's implicitly affirming that such blessings cannot be given. Um, the teaching of fiducia supplicants is therefore self-contradictory and thus requires further clarification. Uh, that's his claim. Uh, what do you think of it? What, did, how did you treat that claim? Um, like I, like I mentioned before, I think it, I think it really rests on, uh, the couple union, uh, dialectic. And I, I think what he's talking about is he's saying, okay, up here in, in paragraph four and five, it's saying, we're not blessing gay marriage. We're not blessing unions. And then later on it's saying, okay, but we can bless, uh, two people of the same sex. And he's saying that, you know, because it's a couple that's coming up, that it has to, that it's necessarily their relationship. So they're saying one thing up here in paragraph five, but then somewhere else down below, they're saying something different. But we can easily harmonize harmonize those two if we, you know, just both read the document, read the document with a spirit of openness and docility, and then, you know, look up in the dictionary couple and union. And sure. I think, I think it solves every every issue. Well, I I guess I don't get it. Is there something? some deep profound point that is eluding me because a couple is not a union a couple is two people that are in you know that the, their their pus- personhood exists and the couple emphasizes the personhood but it's also acknowledging yes the these two people are they do have some relationship between them but that's the whole point with saying we're blessing the couple is because it emphasizes and underscores the fact that we're blessing people as opposed to saying you know we're going to bless this relationship or this union which would be the blessing of the relationship between the persons in the couple uh is there something that i'm not getting about the word couple or about the word union where they're like secret synonyms for each other i just i guess I'm not trying to be just, um, you know, snarky here. Uh, I'm not trying to be deliberately obtuse to make a point. I really don't understand what people are bothered by. I don't. I think it's a good document. It's a fine document. And I, I don't understand what he's saying. Can you unpack a little bit more for us why people like Mueller are so bothered? by this document and what it is that's the the source of confusion between uh about the words couple and union you know yeah of course i think just going back to you know how i'm trying to think how i would have uh, approached this document when i kind of had more of a rad trad mentality and i think i would it would be with a spirit of like okay they're so they're walking right up to the line they're walking right up to the line but they're not crossing it and then they're gonna hope that you know priests misapply it like they're gonna they're just gonna go willy-nilly and say all right gay marriage is okay but they're not actually the vatican's not actually going to come out and say it but i think uh i think michael lofton's pointed this out too like a lot of times especially with humani vitae the church says okay this is as far as we can go on this topic like we nfp is as far as we can go with contraception with fiducia it's talking about this is as far as we can go with gay blessings. We can't bless uh, unions. We can't do gay marriage and we can't do it in a liturgical setting. But you know what? We can do it privately and we can uh, call these people to repentance. And I think I think it's just 
reading this document and trying to find something wrong with it. I, 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 that's the only explanation I can give. Because that's big business right now. You know, if you wanted to write, you know, in the couple weeks immediately um, after the document dropped, if you wanted to write a piece and get it published, you get it published at the big shops and, you know, you can cause a bit of a splash and get some clicks and some more name recognition and some pats on the back, plaudits from people who are on your side. I, I do think that that is a significant draw to people uh, getting on this bandwagon and trying to essentially dunk on this document that is a lot of people rushed in um and and kind of picked up the narrative and helped to further that narrative by by writing more about it and there was like a snowball effect and all of a sudden it just became um at least in terms of a lot of the plugged into social media conservatives in the church it it's like almost this foregone conclusion this is a bad document and we have now snatched defeat from the jaws of victory because it's a fine document. It's consistent with what the church has taught. And um, it's being drawn up as an L for the church, as a loss for orthodoxy when it's not. And this is where people just – we're going to keep having this problem, aren't we, Jake? Because the Pope's going to – I mean, what do you think? The Pope's going to write – more documents. He's going to say more things in his sermons. And it's, in my view, it's always going to be pushing the envelope to be more pastoral without transgressing doctrine. I mean, is that, what, what do you think? How do you feel about that? Do you think this is going to stop? Is there a natural breaking point? Or are we just going to keep going down this path of Pope bashing every time uh, Pope Francis says anything? Yeah, you know, it, it really is a cycle. It's like the Pope issues a document or he says something in the media. The uh, secular media takes that out of context. Catholic media also does the same thing. And then it's like, oh, um, we, uh, this, is this heretical? Is, is this schismatic? Is this heretical, what the Pope just said? And then they'll be like, okay, I think it is. Or he's doing, this is a bad Pope. I think what he's doing wrong. All right, this already confirmed my previously held belief that this Pope is a bad Pope or like I'm a seat of a contest or SSPX. And it already confirms my, I'm glad I have a schismatic mentality. It, it confirms me in that belief. And it's the same thing. It's the same cycle. Every time we, we do it every, every news cycle. And like I mentioned at the start of, of our interview here, it, it's kind of like Trump. Trump would say something that was taken out of context. It's like the media is like, that's racist. Then more details come in and it's like, okay, maybe that's not, uh, racist, maybe it is, and then the media doesn't care about the clarifications, and they're like, okay, we, this confirmed what we already knew about Trump, he's racist, and then we're back to square one with the next news cycle, and I think it's just like that with Pope Francis, and I don't, as far as I don't know how long that's going to continue, I hope it doesn't, I, I'm, uh, I'm it's, it's very tiring, it's not good for the unity of the church, I mean, we can hope, we can pray, and fast that that doesn't continue but unfortunately i don't i don't see it stopping anytime soon well i think it's because we're too obtuse we're too dumb to realize to be like okay what is the thing that uh connects all of these developments under pope francis what is the commonality with all of the francis developments in pastoral outreach and it's this people are not putting out there or wrapping their minds around what I call the Francis Doctrine. And you're not going to understand this pontificate until you come to terms with what the Francis Doctrine is. And the Francis Doctrine is this. Pope Francis is going to make every single pastoral outreach that he can. And he's going to push um, being pastoral to the limits of doctrinal orthodoxy. So every outreach that he can make that is not heterodox, he will make. And he will bump being pastoral into the very edges of heterodoxy and heteropraxy without transgressing them. So whatever he can do to bring people into the fold, he will do and he will extend that to the very limits and edges of orthodoxy without you know, veering or crossing over into heterodoxy or heteropraxy. That is the Pope Francis doctrine. And it's very much um, in keeping with the idea that, yeah, you have to do 
whatever is possible as the shepherd to go after the lost sheep. So you don't want to be so hamstrung by a shepherd's code of ethics that has been codified in these very good and very admirable, but like scholastic manuals where there are a lot of uh, hedges and safety mechanisms built in so that you don't have the appearance of scandal or the danger of scandal, not actual scandal, but the appearance or danger of scandal. Or uh, he's saying, no, like, What's more important is reaching out to absolutely all the lost sheep and all of these mechanisms that were a matter of prudence before that held us back from going after the lost sheep. I'm going to say to hell with those. I'm going to go to the very edges, the the true edges, not the artificial manualist edges of what can be done, but the true edges of what can be done without violating um, orthodoxy or orthopraxy. In order to save people, because people are too important to let the rules get in the way of of saving them. And I mean the the kind of uh, man made rules, the prudential rules, not the eternal rules. Those he does respect. Hence, you know, he'll go as far as he can while remaining orthodox. That is the Francis doctrine. So when it comes down to the next disciplinary change that is meant to include more people in the church. That is what is going to be at the nucleus and the heart of that. Um, So you don't need to lose your head about it. Just like, look, he's not going to violate orthodoxy. And he might shift things over a little bit more to include more people in the church. I don't know. That's my read on this pontificate. I think that is the uniting factor and the commonality in all of these disciplinary decisions. What are your thoughts? I I agree with that. I think that's a very good way to put it. it kind of, it really kind of bookends things and puts things into perspective. I, I agree with that. I think as I come to understand Pope Francis more, I think he really he really has the heart of Christ. I think um, he does things in a way that that Christ did. Then he kind of threw off you know the social norms of the time and the kind of rules and regulations um, to go after people like you said. It's the the woman at the well. It's the uh, the woman caught in adultery. It's like he did things that nobody else else would or 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 could um, at the time. And he was willing he was willing to break all the rules and he didn't care what, you know, his detractors would say about him. He he cared more about uh, coming in the way coming between the person being accused and the mob. than he did about what people thought about him. And I think it brings up another good point. It's like. Hold up a minute, guys. We're we're Catholics. We're Catholics. We eat the body and blood of Christ. Like when has when has optics stopped us from like following our faith? Like when has the optics of oh yeah, I eat Christ's uh, flesh and drink his blood? I I truly believe that. And we like, to the outside world that's going to look crazy. We believe in a God that rose from the dead. To the outside world that's going to look crazy. So all of a sudden, when we apply these things to Pope Francis, it's like. Oh, he's going to bless gay people. Like, doesn't that send a bad optical message to the world? Like, we're okay with gay marriage now. It's like, no, this may, this may uh, scandalize people, but you know they have the freedom to walk away. Like in John chapter six, when people left after the bread of life discourse, and it's like Pope Francis is willing to, you know, sometimes have some bad optics in order to save souls, and I think that's that's pretty admirable of him. Yeah, I, I've come around to thinking that as well, too. And I do, you know, the Pharisee thing is thrown around so much, you know. Uh, it, basically, everyone that somebody doesn't like gets called a Pharisee. But there is a, a stunning degree of Phariseeism that's happening right now in the church where it's like, I'm hewing closely to the normative laws. Um, whereas Pope Francis is saying like, look, we can transgress the normative laws and uphold the non-normative law, the, in, the eternal laws, uh, for the good of these people. And people are clutching their pearls and saying like, they're seeing that as a danger to their faith. They're almost seeing that as a personal attack. Like, well, this is the way it's been done for 400 years. So who are you to change that? It's like, well, he's the Pope and he, he has the keys to the kingdom of heaven and he can make disciplinary changes in so far as you know they are not violating the law of of god himself and these are not so as long as you can square that circle as long as you can 
um, show that these disciplinary changes are not, you know, the blessing of sin, well, then that's the interpretation that must win the day because we know two things. We know, number one, that the church guides is guided by the Holy Spirit in its exercise of the magisterium, both doctrinally and disciplinarily, and that Pope Francis is saying things that are can be interpreted sometimes, I don't think fairly, but let's say in two different ways, one rightly, uh, uh, or one uh, in an orthodox way and one in a heterodox way. Well, then it's uh, as a matter of logical truth and as a matter of faith, we have to interpret him in the orthodox way because we know this overriding truth that the Holy Spirit's looking out for the church and is guiding the Holy Pontiff. So you guys, like, people are, you know, they're criticizing the Pope and taking him uh, in this suspicious way, looking at him in this suspicious light, looking at what he does askance, whereas they need to actually have faith in the in that Christ loves his bride, the church, and he's gonna not going to let her fall into ruin and desolation. Um, okay, so uh, let me let me ask you this: You say, what is at the heart of this controversy is who can have blessings and who cannot? Fiducia supplicant settles this debate and makes clear that blessings are for everyone who present themselves at the feet of Christ, begging for mercy. Um, do you think that's a controversial statement? Do you think there are people? Let's say on on the side of Cardinal Mueller, do you think what they're arguing is that, you know, blessings aren't for everyone who present themselves at the feet of Christ begging for mercy? Because it doesn't seem like that should be controversial, but I have a feeling it is. Yeah, you know, I think I think they have a, a tendency to, uh, you know, say things like, you know, we of course we want to bless the sin. We want to bless the, the person, the bless the sinner, not the sin. We want to uphold uh want to uphold dogma and doctrine and uh, uh one one of my favorites is like you know it's not merciful it's not merciful to affirm somebody in their sin and it's like well nobody said that but you're 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 acting like somebody did say that and you need to refute them it's like nobody nobody said that we're good um <laughs> but i i don't think it's i i really don't think it's controversial but you know it, it probably will be somebody somebody will probably take take offense at that um i I don't know. I don't know how. I mean, if you're begging for mercy, you're obviously repentant. So I, I don't really know how that would be, how that would be controversial. But I'm sure the I'm sure the comment section will let us know. Yeah, I, I have a suspicion that you're right. I mean, the document itself itself says this to make those people feel that they are still blessed, notwithstanding their serious mistakes. That means despite their mistakes. Again, talking about the couple. The people are being blessed that their heavenly father continues to will their good and to hope that they will ultimately open themselves to the good. Now, with when you read it in light of that text. How can anyone be bothered by this? How can anyone be bothered by blessing um, people when you are asking that God will open them up to the good and that they making use of their own free will will open themselves up to the good. How is that a controversial proposition? How is that problematic? I have no, I have no idea. Um, I, I really can't say I, I hope I just, my prayer is that, you know, one thing that helped me get out of that mindset was like, let's apply, let's apply this to myself. Like I'm a sinner. Um, you know, I'm not ashamed to say I've, I've struggled with lust in the past. I, I've gone up to, there's been times where I haven't been disposed to communion and I've been happy to receive a blessing from the, from the priest because at least, at least that helps me feel like I can continue on the journey and uh, try to become closer to Christ and not, not despair. But remember that we have a merciful God who, you know, loves me. And uh, even though I fall, uh, you know, get back on my feet. And I, I want, I, you know, just applying, you know, the things that Pope Francis has said, I, I, the, the thing that helped me get out of that mindset was like, I, I want that mercy too. Like I want that applied to me. I would not want to be rejected of a blessing. I would not want to be rejected of, you know, Christ's mercy. Like, why would I, why would I wish that on somebody else? I, I, I hope, I hope people can like come away from that, from both reading my article and, you know, reading Fiducia and be like, you know what, if I was in that situation, I, I would want the blessing. Like if I'm, 
if I am living that kind of lifestyle and, you know, at least I have the courage to go to church, then, you know, yeah. I'm taking that first step. I'm taking the first step to, to redemption. And I imagine having, imagine like being away from church for years. And I guess if you're gay, you're living with your your partner or something. And you're like, finally, I've convinced my partner to go to church with me that he thinks Catholics are bigots, but I'm going to take him to church, show him it's not that bad. And then you go up to the priest for a blessing after mass and he denies you. And then you never come back to church again. Like ha imagine how bad that would make you feel. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's almost like foreclosing on prayer to the saints, asking for the saints intercession for you. If you are a homosexual living in, um, you know, a disordered relationship with somebody and then being somebody and being like, you know, Mary uh, or Joseph or you know saint thomas or whoever please pray for me in this relationship to foreclose on the priest praying for you to come out of this relationship is essentially like foreclosing on any of the the saints in the church triumphant praying for you so i think it's a great mistake to say that you should not be open to blessing to praying for this couple um that they open their lives to god to ask for his help to live better and also to invoke the Holy Spirit so that the values of the gospel may be lived with greater faithfulness. That's literally what's in the document. Those are the words of fiducia supplicants. I don't see anything threatening there. Uh, anything else, Jake, before um, we have to drop off here, anything else you want to say about your article uh, about Cardinal Mueller's essay in the pillar? Any, any final thoughts you have closing thoughts? Um, just i i hope i hope this reaches out to people um cardinal mueller probably won't read it but maybe his audience people that follow him if i just wish that they they may be pretty critical of it but i hope they they read it with you know at least an open mind and uh may hopefully it, it kind of puts them back on the right track that's that's my main purpose for writing it i just hope it uh you know maybe touches somebody's heart sure any final words to people who maybe may find themselves in a situation like you were, um, you know, before you kind of had this change of mind and heart? Um, yeah, just don't be afraid. The, the water's fine. Uh, synodality is not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for writing the article. Uh, again, I'm going to link to it in the show notes here so that people can read it. And um, thanks for sharing kind of just a, a bit of your conversion of heart. Um, and I think that is something that's going to be very useful to the people um, in the audience and to people, hopefully, who don't follow this channel, who might, you know, stumble on this video through the YouTube algorithm. Hopefully, you've, uh, I know if they tune in, they're going to hear what you said and it's very compelling. So thank you for that. And thank you also for your time. I know it's been kind of a long chat. Uh, I appreciate you appearing and, um, doing this interview and, and kind of unpacking what you wrote. Yeah. Thank you for having me, David. It's, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. Pleasures all on this side of the table, buddy. Um, so guys, uh, again, remember, please subscribe to the channel. We are building a community here. It's not just going to be me, um, or others pontificating to you as if we know it all. Uh, I'm going to start going live here very soon and interacting with people who are followers of this channel and just chopping it up with you guys in episodes, uh, taking your comments and whatnot. I want this to be an interactive uh, platform, um, an interactive show where there is true Christian fraternity and um, you know we can just go back and forth and kind of enjoy each other and, and chop it up. So please do join this, not channel, but community. And uh, for those who do have the means, please kindly support us on Patreon. And we appreciate it very much. Until next time, guys, God bless. See you later.